Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Fantastic. My name is Jen. Welcome to the Toronto International Film Festival in today's screening of The Elephant Queen, directed by Victoria Stone and Mark Diebold. To begin, we'd like to acknowledge that today's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are very grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. As an extension of the TIFF Kids International Film Festival, we are pleased to present this family-friendly film. To today's programming is supported by the City of Toronto and the Ontario Arts Council. This film is eligible for both the Girls People's Choice Award and the Girls People's Documentary Award, so I encourage you to vote at at tiff.net slash vote. We'd like to thank Endeavor Content for providing us with the film today. When considering films for the festival, it's always a big challenge because there's so many promising <coughs> films that come our way. But there's something about this film that really stayed with me. It was uh, the minute I screened it, I just thought this film has so much heart. And I just kept saying that to everyone. The journey that both Mark and Victoria have captured is nothing short of amazing. They truly get into every single nook and cranny into one of the oldest national parks in Kenya. And it's really at the heart of it is this awesome lady, Athena, who you're going to meet. She leads with courage and conviction. That is sometimes in my opinion, missing from the human world. Uh, we could take a lesson, I think. Uh, I could go on and on, but without further ado, please welcome the filmmakers to the stage, Mark and Victoria. Hello, everyone. We're very excited to share The Elephant Queen with you and honored that it's here at TIFF. Um, we, it took eight years to make this film, and we'll be up here afterwards with members of our team to answer any questions. Look forward to seeing you then. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you all so much for that amazing response to the film. I won't delay any further. Please welcome to the filmmakers, uh, Victoria and Mark, to the stage. <laughs> I'd like to introduce um, Lucinda Engelhart, who brought her extraordinary producing talents to the film, and Etienne Olif, who worked with us as our assistant director in Kenya for four years and is now running our outreach and education program in Kenya. I will just get started with the first question and then we'll take as many as we have time for. Um, eight years in the making, this was not a, a quick and easy, an easy job to pull off. Uh, maybe you can talk about sort of why um, you wanted to make the film, or what was important to you about getting involved in the project for you guys. Well, I think we'd, you know, we'd never really tackled elephants before. We filmed in East Africa for 30 years, all, like, always wildlife subjects. And elephants had somehow been sort of tangential to the films we'd done. And it took, I think it's, you know, we are always slightly apprehensive about them because they are such such extraordinary creatures and we didn't really felt, feel we kn that we knew them. But then we started picking up little bits of, well, little sort of sightings and, and we'd sort of file them away. And then it was only in the terrible drought of 2009-10 that we went to film elephants. And we thought, cracky, you know, these are such extraordinary animals. Um, they just reflect so many of the, the emotions that, that humans have and knowing what we had about them and all the sort of smaller stories and that we thought we have to, to make a film about them. Fantastic. And do you want to sort of explain where you guys came into the project and, and your involvement? Um, I think for me it was um, exciting to find a project that could tell a story about elephants, um, a story about elephants that would reach a really you know much wider audience. Um, which is why it's so exciting that we've part partnered with Apple because uh, for the next stage of the film to release because I think they've got a truly global vision um, to ensure the story gets seen far and wide. And also an opportunity to work with Mark and Vicky who have just uh, tell such intimate tales, <laughs> um, which I, I found very exciting as a, as a producer. Yes, um, I likewise. Um, I started with Mark and Vicky many years ago, and we've um, made a series of films together. And when they invited me onto this project, it was uh, a great honor, and it was uh, it, what followed was a, an incredible adventure, um, and which developed continuously. Um, 
for for a number of years, and and subsequently um, after the film, the it developed into an outreach and educational program, which was taking the story, taking our subjects, taking what we learned to uh, to to Kenyan youth, and that's a big part of of what um, follows the film. Fantastic! Did I see hands? Yes, right here. Go for it. We, we knew from the outset that we wanted to tell a story that would reach the broadest pot possible audience. And there are some fantastic films that deal with issues and are very, uh, they're very, very hard, some of them, to watch. But what we felt was that the world needed to fall in love with elephants and to realize what sentient beings they are and how they are just like us. And yet, within maybe our children's or our gen grandchildren's generation, there could be no elephants left in the wild on this planet. And to, to us, that's unthinkable. So we just wanted to make a film that would yeah, make the world fall in love with elephants and get behind them, give them a voice. Fantastic. Wow, so many hands. Okay, uh, let's go about halfway up on the aisle. Go for it. Or just behind, yeah. <laughs> Believe me, he was yeah. that close. So the question is about the camera work and how you get those unbelievable shots. Well, we, we did have some huge lenses, but we also got very close. And one of the ways we do that was to um, dig a metal sort of box about a metre by a metre by a metre and a half down um, below ground level beside the water holes. And then I'd wait inside um, in a uh, way what, to, what to try and we... really get the um, the you know, the smaller creatures at their level, but also that get their perspective on these huge elephants as they came, they came in. So literally we would, this metal box, imagine um, it was a bit like an oven because the top was open to the bright African sun. And at, before dawn, we'd put Mark in and when it got dark, we'd let him come out again. <laughs> but in the meantime, he had to spend, there was one time when he spent an entire month in that box and in the end we realized we were doing him mental harm so we actually <laughs> allowed him to have a break but mark i think you should tell one of the one of your stories from inside the box well i mean it, it did get extraordinarily hot i mean it got too hot so we had a metal lid and it got too hot to touch the lid um and at times in the middle of the day you know when there weren't elephants around i think okay i can have a have a bit of a break now so i because it was so hot and because it was sort of wet down on the floor i tended to take my clothes off and i'd curl myself around in a ball around the tripod and I think on one occasion, well, perhaps more than one occasion, I did fall asleep and I woke and I thought I'd woken myself by my own snoring. But a big bull elephant had come really silently and he'd put his trunk, he'd inserted his trunk down through the, the, the hatch. And I woke to find his, his trunk right in my face there. And I wasn't sure what to do, but we'd... we'd visited the Nairobi orphanage, the, the elephant orphanage there, and I'd seen the keepers there sort of communicate and calm the elephants by blowing in the end of their trunks. So I thought, well, this is the only thing I can do. So I very <laughs> gently whoosh, into the end of his trunk, and he immediately knew that it was a, a human there. But I, I don't think he felt that fearful, but the whole sort of trunk sort of uncoiled itself, which shot out through the back of the, um, the hole, and he, he, you know, just lumbered away, shaking his head, and the whole ground shook. <laughs> Unbelievable what you're doing there. Uh, let's go down here right in front. Great question. So the question is about how it's going to be distributed, which we now have an answer to. Yeah, no, well, we're thrilled that here um, Apple it will be distributing the film both theatrically and on their platforms, which couldn't be a better partner. And I mean, the way, I, the way I've told it to my mum is um, we might reach a billion eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> Which is amazing. Uh, yes, let's go over here in the black shirt. Yeah. Uh, it was an extraordinary documentary. I especially like the cast of supporting characters. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> Fantastic. We'll go just next to you in the white shirt. I just wondered, so the, the came early in your 
Well, we had we actually ended up with with two droughts. We had a we had a terrible drought in two thousand and nine ten when we got some of the you know, those devastating scenes of the um, of the zebra especially dying and then we had another one when we were filming which was more like 11 12 and the thing about droughts is that they tend to be fairly localized um, because you know the rain the rains in africa are, are strange where we are you know you can get incredible thunderstorms and but they they move around so you might get you know from the air you get these extraordinary patches of, of grass and then on to one side it will it'll be absolutely you know burnt and without water and in fact when we when we first started um etienne and i went on a, on a recce and we found what was we thought the most beautiful waterhole um it had everything going on in there we, we it was just outside the national park we moved our camp there you know we saw bullfrogs we saw there's a crocodile in it the birds were all there and it was just an oasis of just this perfect oasis. So we moved our camp there. We cut an airstrip, and the the waterhole dried up. We thought, fine, you know, this will be fine. Next next wet season, it'll it'll fill up again, and it didn't, and it didn't after that. <laughs> and in the end, you know, we were forced to move our camp back into into the national park. And in the the four years that we were filming there, that waterhole never filled. <laughs> so the amazing thing is that when it does fill again, then the the you know the the um, bullfrogs in that underground will just, you know, the whole thing will spring to life again. I mean, it really is totally remarkable those, how those temporary pans just fill with life after rain. Unbelievable. Um, yes, let's go sort of second row, just up here, gentleman wearing, yes. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I think that was probably our sound designer. Um, you know, he tried to convince us. He said, "Look, he said we've got to have a bit of humour here," and we thought, and we ummed and ahed about it. And in the end, we we had a, a test screening and with some children, <laughs> and they just loved. It just made them, you know, just identify with those dung beetles. And we thought, well, you know, it is it's it's a feature. It's not a straight documentary. It's a wildlife story. And we thought. Let's just, let's just go with it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we have a hand sort of right here. I think you're wearing a hat. Yes. It, it is. I mean, it's a, you know, it was a harrowing scene to, to, to see and, and to film. Um, although when you're filming it, you, you get you know caught up in the moment, like, is it in focus, have you got enough battery power, enough you know, sort of data in the camera and that. Um, but it it is, I mean, elephants are extraordinary creatures and that death scene really, it upset the whole family. Um, and, you know, when you saw it was the Millie, the the daughter, the elder elder daughter to Mimi, you know, she was absolutely distraught. And I think the mother was more in shock and she'd been perhaps knew what was going to happen. Um, but for Millie, you know, if she was distraught, she was, you know, crying and, and yelling. And what I think fascinated us was the way that when Athena came over, um, she sort of calmed her presence, calmed the whole herd. And she, you know, she checked the baby. She she went to lift her up with her tusks and none of the others had used their tusks. They'd always been using their trunks and she tried to lift her with her tusks. And then I think realized actually there's nothing, you know, Mimi is dead. There's nothing we can do here. Um, we, it's one of those things filming that, you know, we could see that, that Mimi was getting weaker and weaker. Um, and we always had this thing up, you know, do we interfere? And the way I think had we interfered in that situation, it would have been more disruptive and distressing to the family because in a way they'd have tried to protect Mimi. So we'd have been fighting the family to gain access to Mimi to try and take her out. When in fact, well, that, that's, that's it. And we thought actually in that situation, there's nothing we can do about it. But we had, the, it was a terrible drought and we did find other babies that had either been abandoned or their mothers had been killed and those we were able to rescue. We, you know, we'd partner with the, the wildlife trust there who, and you know, once we found them, they'd bring in their people and, and you know, they'd take them, they'd take them up to an orphanage and resuscitate them and you know, those babies are still alive today. But it's just that when, 
when the baby is being cared for by the whole family, it's it's almost impossible to to intervene. I mean, we, we have a, a general overall rule that we have no right to intervene unless if we find a calf completely abandoned. Most definitely. Uh, yes, over here in the corner. <laughs> so the question is uh, around poaching and whether or not it's still a problem, and then if rhinos were at the waterhole okay. as well. Poaching is, is still a problem. Um, and, you know, we are losing still about twenty five to 30,000 elephants every year. Um, and the population, you know, the, the population in Africa on the continent can't sustain that. So the, pop, you know, so the, the population is, is on the, the decline, you know, and that's a, a terrible thing. There are more dying than there are being born. Um, in somewhere like Kenya, the, what's happened is the, they've, they've got the poaching under control more. It was terrible in 2011-12, but the poachers have now moved their attention further south. So the first into Tanzania, also into Central Africa. And Tanzania lost something like 60% of its elephants in a decade. And now the, you know, the elephant stronghold where, where a third of the, the global population essentially live is Botswana. And Botswana is now being targeted, so we can't afford to, to, you know, to be complacent about it. We have to, we have to fight for elephants and support those on the ground who are who are doing the work. You know, the the rangers, the conservation NGOs, and that, um, because you know it, it's a very difficult job. And okay, sorry, the second question. I know. Oh, oh right, Rhinos. Rhinos. Okay, yeah. well, that is the tragic thing because when we were, we had a, a camp in Savo, and our. Um, mentor and executive producer Alan Root, who sadly died during you know, the, the making of the film, um, he said to us when he was there, there was something like 8,000 rhinos in Savo. We didn't see one when we were there. And they basically, there was just a handful left in a protected area. Um, but they were, you know, 50 years ago, they were as common as elephants are today. I, I think, you know, exactly that's what shocked me was that he was telling us there were the same number of rhinos. 30 years previously that then we were look, what, seeing elephants today which if what does that mean you know and I think that the tragedy is that you know we we came in only 30 years ago and we you know we, we had no knowledge of, of what there should have been it's this whole idea of shifting baselines you only know what the level at which you come in at um, but you know 50 years ago there were so many rhinos there that they were almost behind every bush and today you could walk across Savo which is over 100 miles and not see a single rhino Okay, let's go uh, right here in the center. Yes, you. Yes. Um, so uh, during the during our time there, we we became very very aware of both the potential for the film and the responsibility we had to use the film for education for outreach. Um, of course, poaching is a is a is a huge issue which has to be addressed. But and the other big issue is just is human wildlife conflict, which simply comes from the fact that human populations are growing and and the the, the mounting pressure on the national parks. So. Um, from the film was born a commitment amongst all of us to to work to inspire and educate youth, the next generation, the next generation of custodians. Um, and we found some wonderful partners who who joined us and and felt the similar commitment. So, w in short, it's it's a it, we established an outreach and educational program, which is an extensive. Um, 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 opportunity to really use the film and that's working with the government it's working with Kenya Wildlife Service who who, who, who manage all the national parks it's working with the uh, Ministry of Education the Institute for Curriculum Development so and and extracurricular wildlife clubs uh, conservation organizations and it, in brief it's it's a, a three-tiered um, program which is taking the film out to the communities and schools translating it into Kiswahili and Ma the two two main languages in, in East Africa. It's um, creating um, reading a reading series, so using literacy to bring wildlife, um, to bring conservation and environmental education into, into classrooms. It's
it's developing theatre productions, th plays for extracurricular, um, and, and a variety of things. We, we absolutely realise the importance of inspiring youth towards uh, an appreciation of, of what effectively is their natural heritage. Fantastic. Unfortunately, we only have time for one last question here. Can, and we're going to go right up here on the aisle. I think you're wearing a blue shirt. Yes. Elephant memory. I mean, <laughs> elephants have phenomenal memories. And I'll just try and um, t share a story very quickly. We had a, a bull elephant who came into our camp, and we thought there was something strange about him. And he'd come around, he'd, he'd hang around for days. And we, we actually, in the end, we, we managed to, to unravel his story. And it was that he had been an orphan raised by the, the, um, the Sheldrick Orphanage and then released or let back into the world and 18 years later he came back and we were able to to basically reconnect him with his keeper and they both recognized each other immediately well that's a good story to end with <laughs> <laughs> i think um before we end we should just thank we have it was a small dedicated crew of about 10 people who worked with us for four years solidly in the field and they're not able to be here today but without them we couldn't we wouldn't be standing here today so i'd like to thank them as well Thank you so much Thank for bringing you. your film to us. It's everyone obviously has loved it. And I just remind everyone to vote tiff.net slash vote. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.